uh, what would be the most important or what they find would be the most useful diet, exercise, stress coping mechanism. So I'm going to start with diet, and I would like to, each one of the panelists, if they can briefly uh, tell us what diet modifications do they use in their practice. Dr. Wilson? <clears throat> well, um, there's many, dis many different disciplines and perspectives on diet. And it's like every, every person in every, every system seems to believe that there's one diet for everybody. And I think th those of us certainly in environmental medicine and integrated medicine don't think so because everybody's uniquely individual. And some people do well on low-fat diets, although I think it's a minority of patients in my experience. Uh, some do very well on uh, the, the eat for your, blo your blood type diet, the Diodamo uh, idea. Uh, some do well on the Atkins. And for every person who does well on a, a given diet, um, there are those who don't. You know, I, I rather like, you know, we're talking about, the, uh, I like, uh, Jim, your comment about um, faith, what the definition of faith. There's a lot of definitions of good health, uh, good health, and one of the favorite ones I've come across is from Dr. Majid Ali many years ago. I heard him talk about this from the, well, two people, you may have heard this from the ancient Pakistani wisdom, but there are five qualities of good health. Uh, first is to be able to live with a deep sense of appreciation numerous times throughout every day for what the universe has brought to you. Secondly, is to be able to have, um, to live with freedom from anger. Uh, third is to be able to ha achieve a, a deep and restorative sleep uh, uh, for every day. Um, fourth is to have an intimate relationship with at least one other human being on the planet. And last but not least, is to have two to three effortless, non-smelly bowel movements a day. <laughs> That's where most people fall apart. I guess Dr. Dr. Wilson basically summarized the five questions that we had here. So. <laughs> now let's go to Dr. If, if I may just add one other little piece. I think the conventional approach to treating, um, to treating cardiovascular disease reminds me of a story of uh, Sven and Oli from Minnesota. They were up in the, they were up in the northern North Woods and they were deer hunting. And when they were out in the woods, uh, Oli shot a really nice big buck. And right about the time that happened, Sven had a stroke. And so Oli um, shows up back at camp. He's dragging this buck back into the camp. And everybody asks him, well, 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 well Oli, what happened to Sven? Well, Sven, he, 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 he had a stroke, Oli said. And uh, they, said, they said to him, well, Oli, you left Sven in the woods? And you brought the deer back? Yeah, Oli said it was a tough call, but no one was going to steal Sven. <laughs> <laughs> And I think that's kind of the example that you know they're they're bringing all of, they're they're leaving the patients in the woods while they're bringing the pharmaceutical company. Uh, to play that's a very good point. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I think I'm going to go and ask one of the ladies now as to what, uh, especially Dr. Campbell, uh, in your practice, which one do you consider is the best diet approach? Is it an indiv individualized one, or do you have one specific that um. you like? Well, I think that um, you ask about my practice, but I think it really starts with my family. Because I believe that, you know, all this advice that we give patients is really merely a tool to empower them to bring that information home to their families because that's where the nutrition happens. It's not in our offices, it's in the kitchen. And so we have to make a plan that's easy for them to understand and follow. So. Some very simple things that I do are, you know, I tell patients, you, you've got to eat the way Mother Nature gave us food. And it's got to be the sort of food that you, you know, if you can pick it, peel it, fish it, harvest it, milk it, you can eat it. But if it comes out of a package in the frozen section of the grocery store and it's breaded and fried, it's probably not so good for you. So stick to the Mother Nature foods and in general, you'll do much better. And how um, about you, Marlene? I would say that uh, the most um, effective thing that I can teach patients is how to eat mindfully and to pay attention to their body signals so that when we, we overeat, a lot of us will overeat. And we get so used to the fact that we're overeating that we don't pay attention to the body or we're watching television when we eat and so forth. And so the, the two things which are to, again, kind of be present with the meal to appreciate the loveliness and the textures and, and so forth, to chew food, and then to pay attention to um, the fullness 
that we experience? Should we go to full or should we go to neutral? I have people rate their fullness on a scale of one to 10. And generally, we're very satisfied at a five or a six. But if we go to a seven or an eight or so forth, we're gonna be very miserable. So, so that would be the idea of clean your plate? Yes. And so we have to be using smaller plate as it yes. used to be. No, no, there is a size difference between the dinner plate that we use now oh. and the dinner plate that we used in 1955. Yeah. And also for us, there is a huge size difference between 1955 average North American um, yeah. weight. I, I'd like to tell a story about that. One morning before we went gluten-free many years ago, I um, was making biscuits for my family and I used my mother's black and white black and red checkered cookbook, you know, the Better Homes and Gardens cookbook. And so I made these biscuits and I thought, this is amazing. I just made five biscuits for my family out of this one recipe. So everybody gets one biscuit, nobody overeats, it's great. And I put the biscuits in the oven and I was cleaning up the mess and I looked in the cookbook and it says makes 15 to 18 biscuits. <laughs> so the portion size from 1955 compared to the portion size in 2000 was three to five times larger in my head and I wasn't even making them as big as Hardy's does so I think that our distortion our portion distortion has dramatically increased over so, time. so for the sake of time I like to see if each one of you can give me a brief um, information in regards What's your exercise advice, uh, Dr. Ha uh, Carter? What do you advise your? Walking. Walking, and how Walking. long? Uh, for 30 minutes, uh, at a pace where you can hold a conversation with somebody walking with you. And I tell them, no window shopping walk type of walking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you, Dr. Oh, sorry. Dr. Wilson? Uh, ditto. Okay. I think that's something that people can do, uh, you know, and, and from a, a different standpoint as well, I knew the new magnetic pulse therapy is a way of exercising cells, and uh, this is a, one we brought into our practice. Patients love it. I mean, they, they just really eat it up, and I would encourage you to explore that. And Marlene? I would say uh, to them to do what they love. And uh, so many times, I worked in chronic pain. We had a, uh, a patient who did everything right, did everything that the, that the therapist asked him to do. And he came back months later for his follow-up and said, I, um, I'm miserable, I am in so much pain. And I said, you know, you're, I'm swimming every day, I'm doing all of this stuff. And I said, what are you thinking about when you're swimming? How much I hate it. I hate swimming. <laughs> That's a good you know? <laughs> We really have to. We really have to just really explore with what what jazzes you. What what you know? Can you find a walking partner? Is that something? You know? You, yeah. That's kind of thing. Except um, that in Canada, sometimes you decide to walk at six o'clock in the morning. You sleep on the ice and break your ankle. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm just a big fan of movement in general. I think when we call it exercise, it tends to um, diminish the effectiveness for many people. So you just have to move. But I am a huge fan of high intensity interval training. So and, do you use the pace system then? Um, I don't use the pace system as much. Um, my number one recommendation for most of my patients is a, is a product called Super Slow. It's a, um, an interval weight training, high intensity, 30 minute workout once or twice a week and the, the scientific evidence of how it provides cardiovascular fitness, strength, conditioning, and um, endurance is re pretty remarkable. And the commitment, the time commitment for my super busy executive type people, 30 minutes once or twice a week, everybody, even me, can get that in. So I have a question for the audience, however, all the participants. Does any one of you use the PACE system or have any experience on advising? Please. I'm using it myself, and I do find it for me. Would fun. you like to come to the microphone? Oh, Ellie, can you repeat that? It's su super slow is the name of the product, um, and it's you know weight circuit weight training, mm -hmm. high intensity, very slow pace. So one leg extension will take you um, about 15 seconds to extend and about 15 seconds to come back. Super high intensity. And, and I do a modification of that because I use stretching bands, uh -huh. I don't use weights, but the intensity for me works well. And there is some evidence recently that you have choices about how you get the exercise in, pulsed or not, 
but that you need to get the work, you need to get the activity. I, I agree that exercise is an off-putting word. You need to get the activity in, however you do it. And that it's very important to enjoy what you do. Can you What's PACE, the, what does that acronym stand for? Yeah, uh, Dr. Chapel probably will, you know, I, I'm following the script. And unfortunately, unfortunately, it's not part of my knowledge base. <laughs> Uh, the PACE system was developed by Al Sears, I think, and, okay. uh, and basically it's an interval training where you do higher intensity and then rest and then higher intensity, and it only takes about uh, 12 minutes a day, so it's, it's, it's uh, shorter bursts and it works quite well for, for cardiovascular fitness. So, um, I, I'd also like to comment that in, in my practice, the patients who have, have dogs uh, seem to have an easier time going to get that going going for a walk and then it, I think that you know even I think there was one study that showed that uh, people had a higher a chance big better chance of surviving heart attacks if they had a stuffed animal I guess it was even better than having a dog so maybe we anybody can get a stuffed animal yeah and I also think you know as as parents um, I have three teenagers so you know uh, the school boards have come to this ridiculous conclusion that the children don't need to exercise. They no longer walk to school. They no longer go outside for recess because it's either too hot or too cold or too dark or there's a coyote in the woods or whatever, you know. That's, my children did not have recess for a week because a coyote had been spotted in the neighborhood several blocks away, Ooh. you know. What coyote is going to come to a, a playground full of screaming elementary school kids? I don't know, but that, you know. So the, the culture has been, you know, just to keep the kids boxed in their Still. little seat. And, and so if we as parents encourage a neighborhood watch so the kids that live a half a mile or less can walk to school or a mile or less or we set the limit, you know, whereas in our school district, no children is allowed to walk to school. Everybody must be bused or, draw, or driven. So, so, so I think that's probably the, the clue to why we have an epidemic um, in childhood obesity. So we are going to we, we briefly um, cover some of these stress coping mechanisms. You have to do something you love. You have to uh, learn to use um, in, um, use your sense of thankfulness and so on. Now let's go into one one issue that is really difficult to deal with, and that is smoking cessation, and which I think is cornerstone in the primary prevention of cardiovascular disease. Um, it would be nice if we can stop teenagers from starting to smoke, but now that they are smoking, what are your best strategies for smoking cessation, Dr. Cart? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I can start off by telling you what not to do. I, uh, I don't write a prescription for Chantix right away. Yeah, sounds uh, reasonable. Uh, Nicorette is very helpful uh, if patients use it. Uh, they have to really get to the point where they quit smoking. They can't cut down to two cigarettes a day or whatever because as soon as they get under stress, they're going to be right back up there with a full pack a day. Uh, the, uh, uh, a lot of patients need some kind of mouth gratification and uh, when they quit, smoke, quit smoking, you can uh, either use a nicotine gum or any other kind of, uh, of uh, gum. Uh, the chelation patients, I tell them that uh, if they continue to smoke, they're going to be taking two steps forward, one step backwards. Two steps forward, one step backwards. And, and I don't tell them that they're not going to get any benefit at all because that's not true. Unfortunately, uh, that's not true. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Wilson, well, what's your approach? Well, my, my comment would be that uh, what I've seen and it's most effective for quitting smoking in my practice, uh, number one, is patients who have, to, who have a desire. If you don't have a desire, forget it. Uh, but it's hypnosis. You know, I think 70 studies have shown that 70% of patients after two hypnosis sessions will be successful in quitting smoking. Last weekend, or two weekends ago at the North Carolina Integrated Medical Society meeting, Dr. Larry Burke, who is a staff uh, radiologist at Duke University, gave a presentation on emotional freedom technique and the tapping technique, which um, looks really intriguing and looks like it could be really helpful for smoking. I haven't tried it, but it really sounds great. So, Ellie? Yeah, um, well, I think, first of all, you have to, number one, identify the patients who are smokers. 
I have become rather complacent in my integrative practice, thinking everybody's a non-smoker because they're seeing me. And so, you know, I was surprised for a patient recently I'd been seeing for over a year, and I didn't know she smoked three cigarettes a day. Um, so I think, number one, you have to identify them as smokers, and number two, you have to ask them, are they prepared to quit smoking and give them some questions? I've been surprised through the years how many people, when I asked, how did you successfully quit smoking, they said, well, you asked me to. No doctor before has ever asked me. So I think that's, that's really simple. I do recommend patients go for hypnosis. I do recommend EFT. I have a smoking cessation handout. We want to ask, are you more driven by the habit, or is there another reason why you're smoking? If you're doing it for stress reduction, then we have a whole litany of reasons and things we can do to help stop. You know, Are you waking up in the middle of the night to have a cigarette? Then you may have more of a nicotine addiction than others, so we can focus on that piece of it. So. I'm going to let... Um um, yeah, I have calendars. And Could we have your name, please? I'm Dottie Schaefer. I'm in Cincinnati, Ohio, internal medicine. Um, I just take the calendar off the wall and hand it to them and ask them to pick a date. That's been the most effective thing. <laughs> Acupuncture works very well. I, if they can't quit, I'll assess them for ADD. They're, a lot of people are self-medicating. Mm -hmm. And then um, if they keep smoking, I just make them promise to smoke organic cigarettes, which doesn't have the cadmium. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Marlene? Um, I use cranial electrical stimulation. It's um, cleared by the FDA for anxiety, depression, insomnia, and stress. But uh, Dr. Eidelman, who's a, um, an addictionologist out of uh, Hollywood, California, did a study with um, a thousand patients over a two-year period of time and um, asked them to rate whether they had an urge for to have a cigarette or not. And many people were coming for a, quite a distance and had waited in, in his office quite a bit. So by the time they had, were sitting down to see him, they were actually physically craving a cigarette. And he would put the cranial electrical stimulation on. It's called Alpha Stim. And within two minutes, um, that craving, that physical craving for a cigarette is gone. And he did this in 1,000 patients, and 970 patients responded by within two minutes having um, the craving gone. And so, again, if they want to quit, they can use the Alpha Stim. Um, the craving will be gone for about four to six hours after one treatment. So then they have another treatment and another treatment. And after three or four days, they're usually down to just a couple of treatments a day. And, and so forth. So it's a very effective way. Of, Thank you. Uh, Dr. Mason? Um, yeah. Uh, my question to you, the panel, is uh, what are your feelings about some of the pharmacological managements? Um, I've used some Chantrix in some patients with success, uh, always with a fear of some rather intense neuropsychiatric side effects. Um, I've used low-dose clonidine, centrally acting alpha agonist, that seems to have a uh, greater use now in addictionology than it does in managing hypertension. And it helps to uh, blunt the autonomic nervous system responses as they're going through the withdrawal. That's what drives them back to the nicotine. And which dosages of clonidine do you I'm use? I'm using uh, 0 0.5 you know, usually comes as a 0.1, mm -hmm. and they're usually splittable, and then a dose of 0.1 twice a day. It can be used sort of PRN. Uh, and and do you do a, like a several weeks protocol using clonidine, similar to the Chantix, or? Other oh, question again? Is that do you use, um, is it like a protocol? Do you use um, the clonidine, let's say, 0.5 milligrams twice a day for six weeks, or is yeah. it a different uh, approach? Un un until they've managed to overcome their uh, nicotine addiction. And again, as you pointed out, there is a behavioral perspective too. Mm -hmm. As a former smoker, I can tell you there's a certain got to take a break. You know, growing up, it was like uh, smoke them if you got them. Mm -hmm. right. You know, otherwise keep working. Stay <laughs> on that shovel. Uh, so you have to break that habit of believing that you have to relax, take a break by going and having a cigarette. You know, I took a walk around the building here and they have a little yes, in the enclosure back there yes. for the employees that, you know, if they don't get their break, 
And I remember working in a factory as a, a, a college student at a night shift, and you got 15 minutes every, every shift uh, to go have a cigarette. Oh. And if you didn't go smoke, then you stayed on the line. You know? oh, thank so you. there's a I guess almost Dr. Smith a, has a, a social pressure that you have to deal with in terms of uh, the, the workplace. Thank you. One of the things that I do in my office is if I have a smoker, I'll challenge them, give them a challenge for metals, and you always find you know lead, nickel, and cadmium. You have something to show them. Um, it, it always helps if you can show them. You can tell them that they're going to get heart disease or they can get cancer, but if you can relate it to, I relate it to the metals sometimes, and uh, it, it's pretty powerful. And it's another, another thing when you're interviewing a patient, if they have a history of smoking in the past, they've still got those metals. Mm. So it, it, it's a good way to get them to do a challenge test in your office. Thank you. Dr. Adams? In medical school, we didn't go over the Almanac very much. And so when I had one of the almanac calendars, it caught my eye. There was a line there that said, if you want to quit any bad habits, do so on the second day that the moon is in the sign of Sagittarius. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, and that, I will pick, that's how I'll help them pick the day instead of, uh. And along those lines, one of the, an interesting thing, you know how there's some people that can't go into casinos? There's a patient of mine that can't go into any horse racing tracks, okay, anywhere in America. And he and another gentleman both independently noted that the successful veterinarians here in Lexington, when they operate on their horses, if they can, they will do so by the almanac signs. You know, so something to think about. Uh, an exercise comment, I tell my patients do not go to to sleep without knowing when and where you're going to exercise tomorrow. You're not going to just all of a sudden come to and go, I'll be talking, oh, look at this, I'm exercising. It ain't going to happen. You got to plan it and make, you know, that's one thing. The other thing, if you're going to do something about diet, you got to be able to do it right there at the plate side. And so borrowing from an important historical documentary about a southern family, uh, the, my dietary recommendations are you get to eat veggies, fruits, nuts, and dead critters, a.k.a. the Ellie Mae diet, which is a better <laughs> spin than the paleo diet. You know, I don't want to look like a caveman, but, you know, looking like Ellie Mae is good. But that's all you get to eat, and that's a, you've eliminated most of the high fructose corn syrup. You've elim eliminated the simple carbs, and you know exactly what to eat. It's, you know, veggies, fruits, nuts, dead critters. Thank you. So... Uh, I'm from Chattanooga, Tennessee. I'm so killed Billy Marion's from Chuck Adams. <laughs> You asked the question about uh, what, do you, what do you treat people with, and aside from being mindful and people wanting to do it, uh, I've seconded the CES device, cerebral electrical activity that's been well studied. I do a lot of brainwave activity. You can actually see the anxiety levels, everything come down within a few minutes, by five minutes. And I also had the low-dose naltrexone. Mm -hmm. I don't know if any of you used it. For smoking uh, cessation. For smoking cessation. And uh, I used to use uh, Caterpress but when they have hypertension. But otherwise, I just use LDN, which is cheap, and that seems to work. And the same dosage, 4.5 milligrams of LDN? 1.5, and oh. if you're a big person, then uh, 3 or 3.5. Really low. Really low. Okay. <laughs> One of the stress reduction techniques that I found is effective is we call it the Tahiti chair. I tell patients you can't go to Tahiti, but you can do, the, do it in your own mind, and I recommend that they, in the middle of the day that they lie down on their back on the floor or on the bed and put a chair above them so their, you know, their, their trunk is like so, their, their thighs are this way and their calves are resting on the chair. And when we do put those people on a, uh, on a heart rate variability monitor, it takes about seven to, eight, seven to eight minutes and you see that parasympathetic nervous system kick in. There's something about your feet being above your, your head that your brain gets to thinking that I am now relaxed. And, and now I don't have to be worried about it. And I tell people, just, you know, turn off the phone. You know, that all the problems in the world that you have will be there for you in 15 minutes from now. You don't have to worry about them going away. <laughs> and, and it really does work. And, and it throttles down that adrenaline pump. Right. So if they're going, they're by, by noon or by midday, they're about here. You bring them back down to here. So by the end of the day, they're back up here instead of here. Yeah. Sounds great. Dr. Mulfair? <clears throat> this some 
this some of you may consider a dramatic uh, way to handle smoking. Uh, a patient years ago on a chelation program for significant vascular disease, and he promised me that he would quit smoking. And as several months went by, I confirmed that he had no desire to quit smoking, so I fired him as a patient. Well, that can be an alternative too. Thank you very much for your participation.